even in the last six months, all the words that people are using, the songs we've chosen, everything that today is different, and it's just confirmed everything God's been speaking to me about. So I'm really excited um, with what God's shown me in the Word of God. And um, so if we can go to chapter Luke, uh, chapter Luke, <laughs> book Luke chapter 8. Um, last two months we've been talking about as believers, we need to accept the Word and bear fruit, the fruit that Jesus desires the fruit that Jesus is going to produce in our lives. And the fruit that he desires, he wants to remain. He said that we will produce fruit and our fruit would remain. It wouldn't just come for a day and then rot away. It would remain. And I think it's very important, as we've looked at in the last two months, it's very important to understand the parable of the soul because this is the only parable that Jesus said. If you don't understand this parable... You won't understand any of the other parables I'm going to speak about. And I thought, wow, Lord, this is pretty amazing. So this, this one you really want us to take quite, um, quite notice of. So if we look at Luke chapter 8, verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And you go, okay, Jesus, Interesting. What are you saying? So he expounded this to his disciples in um, verse 14. And he said, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard the word, go forth and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection or maturity. Now, I looked at this and I said, God, what are you trying to say? What is, what's, what's this? And I felt like the Lord was saying, this is, this is the part where the Western church comes. That we, We've got so much. We've got so much. We've got everything at our disposal. We have things in our homes that kings just a century ago would have envied. Just the air conditioner. A king would have paid everything he could to have an air conditioner. And, and we just have these. So we are so blessed in, in this nation. And I was like, God, what are you saying? So who knows that the New Testament was actually written in Koine Greek. It wasn't written in English. It was written in Koine Greek. So I said, well, Lord, if you want me to look at this, let's look at the Greek as we have. We did a word, I did a word study. So the word choked mean is, in the Greek is supnigo. It means crowded and suffocated. The word cares in the Greek is mermima. It means to be drawn in different directions, to be distracted, and to cause anxiety. Riches is plutos. It means focusing on material gain. And pleasures is hedoni which is a gratification of natural desire, not necessarily sinful. And then it all led to fruit to maturity or fruit to perfection. And in the Greek, that is, oh my gosh. (laughs) Talus phara rioyo. And it means bear to completion a full maturity in the spirit that would result in a Christ-like conduct and character. And that's all good. So now we put that into actual what Jesus was talking about. So we can see that Jesus is actually saying, and those are the ones that are crowded and suffocated by things that draw them in different directions, that distract them, that cause anxiety in their life, Ones that focus on material gain and or the gratification of natural desires in this life. And by doing so, they do not bear to completion a full maturity in the spirit that would, if they let it, produce a Christ-like conduct and character in their life. God is amazing. God loves us so much. 
Love. Love means speaking the truth. We, 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 I, I couldn't even count on fingers, toes, and anything else that I, I have. How many times we said, speak your truth. Speak your truth. Today, we said, speak your truth, speak your truth. And God was just going, that's it. Speak my truth. Fruit that God is seeking in our lives, as we can see in that scripture, is not an outward manifestation, so to speak. It's not a, an achievement or a goal or something that we want to, to achieve or, or, or a goal we want to fill. It's an inward fruit. It's a fruit of the heart. God's been after our heart from the very beginning. You can see it in the children of Israel when they come to Mount Sinai. God has been after the heart of man. The heart. That's, that's the only thing he's interested in. That's the only thing we really take to us when we leave this life, is how much fruit did God produce in our heart? And that Christ-like conduct and character, did it produce? Did the fruit produce? A quick little tangent. When you do a study on 30, 60, 100, it's talking about partial completion or full completion. 30 and 60 are those that... that they let the word of God, they, let, they accepted the word of God and let it bear fruit, but not to completion. A hundredfold is those that let it bear itself to completion into the full conduct and character of Christ our Lord. Now, that's all good, that's amazing, and that's the truth of Scripture. But how do we apply that to our life? How do we work with God to produce this fruit to allow God to produce this fruit. Let's go to John chapter 4, 23 to 24. Thanks, brother. God is good. So in John chapter 4, pretty amazing passage of Scripture, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. Now, if you ever question God's love, and you also question women's roles in the church, you look at the Samaritan woman, you look at what Jesus did. He took out of his time to meet a woman who was in complete sin. She'd had five husbands, and the man she was with now was not her husband. And yet he stopped and talked to her. And she goes, she was so starved. She said, you being a Jew, you're talking to me, a Samaritan woman. She came to the well when all the other women were gone. Because she was ashamed. Jesus met her in her shame. Hallelujah. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24, But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I've, I've, I've seen this scripture a lot of times. And I'm like, Lord, what are, you, what are you saying? What are you showing me? So again, we go back to the Koinonia Greek because I found that if you've ever done a word study, the English language is a little bit butchered. The English language has the same word for eight different meanings. And how do you tell whatever meaning it is? It's whatever you think it might mean. Love. I love the chair. Well, do you like the design? Do you like how it feels? Do you like the comfort of it? Do you want to marry the chair? What the heck? <laughs> you love the chair. But if I said in the Greek, I certain of the chair, you'll know exactly what I want to do with the chair or whether I like the design or what it is. So when we look at the Koine Greek, the word worship means, well, First, it, it's the Greek word, proskunio. Don't know why. When you try to pronounce things, you, you seem to put some weird little accent in, don't you? I don't understand that, but anyway, <laughs> praise Jesus. So worship means to prostrate oneself in homage, reverence, and to bow completely down. The word spirit is numia, with a silent P if you wanted to know. It means without natural touching, invisible, and yet powerful. 
Truth is the Greek word alithiama. Alithia. No M in there. Alithia. It means not merely ethical, but in full sincerity and integrity, absent of any falsehood. And when I looked at this and I put them all together, what John chapter 4, verse, 23, uh, verse 24, is really saying is, God is without natural touching. He is invisible and he is powerful. And they that will come and prostrate themselves in homage, reverence, and in bowing down must prostrate themselves in homage, reverence, and in bowing down knowing he is without natural touching, invisible and powerful, and not from a mere ethical basis, but in full sincerity and integrity, absent from any falsehood. I have come to believe and am convinced through the scriptures and many other scriptures than what I've read, that our ability to walk with God, to hear his voice and to do his will is directly related to our willingness to live in complete transparency with the truth. This is very important and I feel like God has, has given, and, and the more you do a word study on truth, and, and in how many times it's in the scripture and where Jesus talks about it and how many times in the gospel, it's incredible. And, and, and I believe this is where God's saying, I need you to accept it and bear the fruit of it. The word will produce the fruit if we accept it. I don't say the word is easy to accept. Jesus, Jesus offended many people. You read through the gospels. He offended people everywhere he went. And then if that wasn't enough... He preached a message that offended every one of his disciples except the 12. It said that many, many of his disciples turned and did not walk with him after that message, that you shall eat my flesh and drink my blood. But he turned to the 12 and said, will you go also? Has this offended you? And they said, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. This fruit that Jesus is looking for in our lives is in direct contrast to what we see as the other fruit. The, uh, the fruit that would be produced in our lives if we took another road than worshipping in spirit and in truth. We can see this in John chapter 8, verses 44 to 47. God loves us so much that he would prefer to offend us with the truth than to let us live in a lie. John chapter 8 verse 44 is incredible. It shows us the direct contrast to the fruit that Jesus wants to produce. And he said to the Pharisees, And you are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. For he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which... Of you convinces me of sin. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Hallelujah, Jesus. He that is of God hears God's words. You, therefore, cannot hear them because you are not of God. This is really powerful. We also see in, um, well, Oh, yeah, we also see in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, that Ananias and Sapphira lied to God and they paid with their lives. Um, 
We also see in 1 Timothy 4.2 that it says, Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared as if in a hot iron. Um, I thought it was really interesting. There's a lot of times in the scriptures where it talks about the fruit of lying, the fruit of a lying tongue, the fruit of a lying uh, spirit or deception in our lives. I chose these three because they illustrate three completely different Greek words for lying, which is incredibly amazing. These three, um, these three Greek words in Koinonia Greek show us what the full fullness of living in opposition to the truth with the fruit of lying and deception looks like in our lives. In John, lying is pseudos, with a silent P. Means to live in falsehood where you can deceive in appearance or aim to appear false. In Acts, it's pseudo amai, which means intention to deceive. And in Timothy, it's pseudo logos, which means speaking falsely and deceiving with words that are untrue. When, when you look at these, if any, or the degree that these are present in our life, are what hinder our ability to hear and walk with God. And most importantly, it becomes a filter. It becomes a filter that you look at the Word of God. To the degree these are in your life, you will not believe the Word of God because deception is in your heart. If deception is in your heart, you can't believe the Word of God. You can't. It, it, they're contrary to each other. It's impossible. If you, if the, the, the level of deception that's in you is direct contrast to how much you can believe what God speaks. Hallelujah. So, I don't think any of us want a filter in our lives to, to, to filter how we perceive God, how we hear God, how we walk with God, how we, how we believe God's Word. If we allow these, these, the appearing to false, the, the speaking false, untrue words um, into our life, we're effectively listening to and agreeing with the devil because Jesus said there is no truth in him. He is the father of lies and he only speaks lies. Jesus said, I speak the truth. All that love the truth come to me. At this point, I think it's very important to understand what Jesus was talking about in uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. If we can go there, hallelujah. Thank you. Praise Jesus. God, you're so good. Your love is so amazing. And you, you want the best for each and every one of us. Hallelujah. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. When I looked at that, I said, Lord, that's very interesting. I then again went to the Koinonia Greek and was quite surprised that the word love there wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought it could have been uh, many of the other types of love that God's talking about. The love that he's talking about there is the Greek word agapo, in contrast to agape. It's agapo. This kind of love is, means to show or prove one's love outworked through a social and or moral sense. The fruit that God produces in our life is a proof that we, agapo, do for God and others in what we do and what we say. This is how we love God with all our heart, mind, soul. This is how we agapo God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, spirit, everything. And, and how we love our neighbour, our agapo, our neighbour as ourself. Not proving to God or others this love 
we're deceiving ourselves. We're accepting a lie from the enemy. We're accepting that this is not what God intended when he said, you shall love the truth and the truth shall set you free and you will love your neighbour as yourself and you will love God because we've allowed that deception that we may even go through life not even realising a lot of what that word lying meant is it can, can sneak its way in. The enemy's goal is to sneak it in and his goal is to justify it as many things I've heard. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just a white lie. It doesn't, it's not hurting anyone. Okay, but is it hurting you? According to the Word of God, it is. Hallelujah, Jesus. Deception in our heart has no place when we want to believe the Word of God. Jim, a mate Jim that I made up, he um, gets up in the morning, realises his alarm didn't go off, so he's a little bit late already. Him and his wife and his family need to get to church. It's a, it's a Sunday morning, they want to go to church. Jim's like, all right, I've slept in, but if I do this, I can do a little bit of work. can get in the office, do a little bit of work before church, which is what I needed to do because i got a, a, a thing to do on Monday. Gets up, gets dressed, get, has breakfast, quickly runs into the office. The wife hollers out and says, Jim, I need you to help with the kids. He's like, oh, I need to get this work done. All right, all right. Um, what do you need done, love? Um, I need this, this, and this, and this. Okay, if I do that, I can, I can get back in. I can just finish this work before we have to head off to church. So he runs off, helps with the kids, runs back, just sits down, gets his pen, about to do his stuff, gets his keyboard, whatever he has. And um, the wife goes, ah, oh, I need help with this. And Jim's like, oh, bless God. <laughs> Rightio. Um, yeah, I really got to get this done. Yeah, but I need help. And so they, they exchange louder words with each other. <laughs> and he goes, all right, comes and, comes and helps with the kids and then doesn't have time to get his work done. So Jim's a little frustrated. Then they all jump in the car. Kids are all in, wife's in, Jim's in. Jumps in the car, reverses out, crunch. Oh, no. Jim's just run over his youngest son's bicycle. He's damaged the car and he's damaged the bike. He gets out, looks at it, and he's not happy. Blames the wife for not moving the bike. The wife reacts as you would expect. <laughs> the youngest sees his mangled bike, pulls to the side, starts bawling his eyes out. Jim jumps in the car, and he's praising God, of course. He's, yeah, he's not happy. He's frustrated, and he, him and his wife are having an argument on the way to church. They get to church. The kid's still crying. Jim goes, I promise to get you the best bike when we get home. Just stop crying. We're going to church. Stops crying because he's getting a brand new bike. Heck yeah. Walk into church with all kids in hand, big smile. Pastor comes up and says, hey, how's your day, Jim? Oh, fantastic, Pastor. <laughs> Rightio. And Pastor goes, oh, that's good to hear, Jim, and walks away. And Jim's day was not fantastic, and Jim's not happy, and Jim just lied. Didn't hurt anyone, Pastor's note, but simple. You've got Kim goes to work, had to call a uh, client yesterday, forgot to do it. Boss comes in, says, how'd you go talking to uh, Susan about that contract? Oh, no, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I rang and left a message. And, um, yeah, I'll call her again this morning and see if I can get a hold of her. Oh, good, good work, Kim. I'll, um, let me know how you go with that. No worries. Hasn't hurt anyone? Not true? Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Last one, Erica and Peter. Erica and Peter want to buy a house. They've been saving for 18 months. They can't afford it. They haven't got their deposit. They go to Erica's parents. They go guarantor. They grab, they um, don't need the 20% deposit. They get the house. Friends come over. Lovely house, Erica. Oh, yeah, thank you. And she goes, oh, me and, uh, me and Paul are thinking about buying a house. Uh, how hard did you have to work to get the deposit? Oh, um, 
oh, Pete and I have been working really hard for 18 months and, and saving. Oh, okay, no worries. Yep. So it's true. They have been working hard for 18 months. But the attempt and the intent is to deceive, not to say, oh, we didn't actually get the deposit. We were working hard and it wasn't enough. So it's easy to see in these little examples of life how deception roots itself in our hearts. Um, and now that God is starting to shine that light, I'm very thankful, but also I'm like, God, I need your help. <laughs> this is nasty. This is harsh. It's like what the disciples said, Jesus, this is a hard saying. How can anyone bear it? We lie to protect ourselves. That's ultimately, we lie to protect our image, ourself. We avoid pain. But what the lie we're actually believing is the enemy saying, oh, it won't hurt anyone, it'll be okay. But you're actually hindering your relationship with God. You indirectly... Uh, and then we wonder, okay, God, what are you saying? What are you sa-? And we live in, in so much untruth every day that how can we recognize truth, Jesus said. How can you believe my words when you actually hear them and see them? Because you're not living in truth. Praise God. If we, um, if we allow that to continue in our lives... The enemy will continue to steal. He will continue to have authority to steal. If we go to John chapter 16, verse 13, we can see that God is for us and not against us. He's encouraging us to live a life that honors Him. I love what Brett was saying about living pleasing. It's not about questioning the love of God. You lie, God loves you. God will never stop loving you. God even accepts you into his kingdom because you believed in Jesus Christ. But you can't live in victory. The degree that deception lives in your heart will be the degree you believe the word of God. And if you don't believe the word of God, you can't live in the victory that the word of God promises. John chapter 16, verse 13. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. How be it? Oh, that's my old King James. I don't know what the other one says. However, however, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He is what? The Holy Ghost is the spirit of of truth he will guide you into all truth he will strengthen you to live a life that is founded in truth the spirit of truth comes to guide us into living a life of truth if we choose the path of deception and lying over the truth we grieve the precious Holy Spirit and when we grieve him It becomes harder to hear him, to sense him, to follow him because he only, only abides in the truth. That's all he abides in. That's all he's come to testify of. That's all he's come to empower us to live in the truth. When we learn to walk in the complete transparency of the truth in good conscience before God. Paul talks about him living in good conscience before God and man, that he would tell them the truth if they even didn't want to hear it because it was his, it was his, his obligation to God that if I tell you a lie, if I, if I do not tell you a truth, if I tell you a half-truth, then I'm not pleasing or walking in honour before God. And God, that sees everything in secret, rewards you openly. He rewards you with his blessing of knowledge of who he is, his power. You want to walk in his power. We have to walk in his truth. How can he trust us with power if if he can't even trust us to tell the truth? When we know the fullness of loving God and others, 
And we know how much God loves us and wants us and is for us to walk in the truth, to tell the truth, to be in the truth as the spirit of truth is. The perfect love of God that is shed in our hearts because of the truth that we walk. I don't say it'd be easy. I don't say persecution won't come. I don't say that you'd have to deal with the, um, the cover-ups that we do. The truth hurts. The saying, the truth hurts, has to come from somewhere. It comes from that the truth hurts. Hallelujah. And that perfect love will cast out all of our fears. We lie because we're fearful. We're fearful how that person will receive us, what they will think about us. Oh, what trouble am I going to get in if I tell the truth? The truth actually sets us free. If we get in trouble for the truth, that causes us to look at the mirror of God's Word, to look at who God is and say, God, how can you help me? How can you assist me to not do this next time? But if we just lie, we have no motivation, no conviction. The Holy Ghost we were singing today comes to convict. We have no conviction if we just choose to lie or, or, or tell half-truths or just, just a tiny little thing. I, I know, I've said it myself, it doesn't hurt anyone. It is true, I've heard it, I've said it. It's, okay, it's, it's got to be how you phrase it because you're not lying. But then when I looked at that Greek word and it says the appearance, the appearance, not the words you speak. We've put so much into the words we speak that it's the appearance, it's the motive, it's, it's what are you actually trying to achieve here. And my, 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 what I'm trying to achieve in this instance is to tell the truth with words and deceive with perception. And God sees that. God sees that completely, utterly, transparently. And unfortunately, it only hinders our relationship with Him, which is the greatest relationship we should seek. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through to 7, Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Rejoices in truth. We love, as we saw, we love when we speak the truth. A lot of you say, how do I love my neighbour? How do I love God? Well, start with speaking the truth. Start with abiding in truth and, and see, see what God does. Hallelujah. God is for us. He loves us and he wants us to live in perfect union with him. He wants us to know what the tactics of the enemy are that keep us from him. And, and I want to thank you, Jesus, for shining the light of your truth on this tactic of the enemy. If we can grasp this, if we can get this, we can walk with God. If you don't want to walk with God and you just say you do, then don't change, don't do anything, don't, don't even worry about it. But if you want to walk with God, you have to learn to walk in the truth. You have to. And I would pray that the Holy Spirit, if these words are true, He would testify. He would convict our heart. He would show us in our lives, even today, which is not a very old day, what we have said, what we have done. What we have perceived, tried to make someone perceive that was not true. That life, oh, we got it all together. That life's great. That everything's just fantastic. Oh, God is good. What well, do you believe that? 
We're here to encourage each other. God has built the church. Not so that we can be false. There's no falsehood out within the, in the world, in the domain of the enemy. But that we can be transparent with each other. Because we want to abide in the truth and God is our ultimate desire. So if I can have a musician, the musicians, anyone who doesn't probably want to come to the altar and go, God, I want to walk in truth. I haven't walked in truth. I have been a liar. I haven't understood the tactics of the enemy. I, um, I now see, Jesus said, I've come into the world that those that, might, uh, those that are blind may see and those that see may be blind. I now see, Lord, what you're showing me and my sin remains because I see. But I want to be cleansed. I want to walk in the truth. I want to walk with God and I'm willing to take these steps. I'm willing to accept the Word of God and bear its fruit. If you feel God pushing on your heart, I encourage you, come up here. Um, I'll pray with you. And together we'll encourage each other to walk this life, walk the narrow road. Jesus said, It is the narrow road. It's the narrow road because it's not easy. If it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. But it's not easy to walk with God because we have a fallen nature. And our propensity is to be deceiving. It's our nature. Only God can change our nature. Only God can work in our heart that we don't want to walk in deception. I encourage you as the musicians play the, um, maybe that song that was My Heart Lord Speak Truth My Heart Lord Speak Truth Thank you Jesus <laughs>